Romans 14, the first 12 verses. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. And the King James text today reads, Him that is weak in the flesh, in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the living and, excuse me, of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, The Way I See It. Amen. The Way I See It. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, once again, God, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, today to come into the house of God to benefit from the hearing of the Word of God for you declare in that Word. Now faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The intention, the purpose in the heart of every believer today, O oh God, is that they might increase their faith, that our understanding of you, our comprehension of your ways, our grasp of the revelation of God might be greater day by day. When we come into the house of God <clears throat> and hear the word of God preached and taught and delivered, Oh God, when the anointing of the Holy Ghost is present, then Lord, it goes beyond merely our ears, our hearing, but it actually enters into the corridors of our heart. And it brings about change. It causes us to be transformed as our faith reaches higher to greater heights and deeper depths. We ask God today that you would anoint this feeble, weak messenger this hour that I might deliver the word of God that you've laid upon my heart for your people at this time. I cannot possibly do it without you. 
touch the heart and hearing of every individual who is now and who will later come under the sound of my voice. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Had a bit of a rough night last night. I go through some nights like that. I didn't sleep real well and I forgot today to bring my phone so that I could monitor and I could acknowledge folks that are with us online. But we're grateful for all of you today who are with us online. Amen. You know, I grew up in the fundamentalist Pentecostal movement, the Assemblies of God. And if ever uh, there has been a problem in the Christian community, and I've got to tell you, it is not an Assemblies of God problem. It is, it's not even an evangelical or fundamentalist problem necessarily, although, frankly, I do think it tends to be far more a problem in evangelical and fundamentalist churches. But if there ever were a problem that works against the growth and the development of the church, it is the tendency on the part of many of God's people to constantly think that it is their job to convince everyone with whom they come into contact that they ought to see and understand everything in the Word of God the way they do. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? You know people like that? You know, you cannot say anything. You cannot do anything. You cannot express a thought or an opinion without them immediately beginning to school you. Or they think they're going to teach you something. Or they're going to scold you. And help you know what the Bible really means. And what it really says. And what you really ought to be doing. And how you really ought to be doing it. And there's no room in the church, in the minds of many people, there is no room for diversity of opinion or singleness of thought. There is no room for uh, independent thinking. Well, I've got news for you. Now you start to get into cultish waters when you begin to think. But you know, part of the problem is not everybody in the congregation is on the same page either with the pastor. So you've got the pastor of the church who's up there Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, whatever the service schedule may be, teaching and preaching and delivering the Word of God and presenting certain things. And then without fail, you'll have people in the congregation who think they're smarter than the pastor and think they know better than the preacher does, and they will, if given an opportunity, they will begin to try to help people in the congregation see things the way they see it and the way they understand. Well, you know, Pastor Charles was saying last Sunday, blah, 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 but, you know, I understand the Bible to say thus and so, and they begin to deliver their own ideas and deliver their own thoughts. And there's nothing wrong with sharing your opinions. There's nothing wrong with sharing your thoughts. Where the problem comes in is when you behave in such a manner that you think it is incumbent upon you to sway everyone who hears you to see things the way you see things. To understand things the way you understand things. Well, I'll tell you, God's people are not called to doubtful disputations. We're not called to debate. We're not called to argue. We are not called to uh, correct one another at every turn. One of the things that amuses me is a lot of times the people who are doing the correcting so-called the people who are doing the educating and the teaching if you ask them that's oh I was just teaching them what 
the Word of God say? Uh, most of the time, in my experience, they're the last people on the planet that should be doing these things. They're not qualified. They, they don't even know their own subject matter well enough or, listen to me carefully, or they haven't got the requisite uh, accompanying traits that are necessary to effective ministry, that are necessary to effective preaching, that are necessary to effective pastoring, that are necessary to effective leadership, that are necessary to effective teaching. You say, well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? What do you mean, uh, you know, the necessary uh, accoutrements? Well, all you have to do is be able to present your idea and keep pushing it at people until they finally come around to your way of thinking. No. No, a good teacher and a God-called teacher and a God-anointed teacher... First of all, they're going to have a calling on their life. They're going to have an anointing on their life. But also there are other things that are necessary to be an effective life. For instance, patience. Wisdom. Wisdom a lot of times will tell you when you need to shut up. I'll tell you. I can't tell you how many times someone will say something or someone will do something or someone will be talking with me about something and there's, there's a natural desire on the inside to correct them. There's a natural desire on the inside to instruct them and help them understand that, no, the way you're understanding that is not altogether right. The way you're seeing that's not altogether right. And yet wisdom speaks in my ear and says to me, hold your peace. Don't say anything. Well, I'll tell you something. I think hold your peace is probably the most commonly used phrase that wisdom uses. I know people that at every single turn, we've had people in this church, we've had folks who are members of our church, and we'd be sitting at dinner somewhere after church and someone would make a comment about something. Maybe they don't understand what our church teaches or what our church believes. Maybe they don't quite understand certain things. And they'll make a comment and of course it hits your ear because you see things differently. You understand things differently. It hits your ear and it's, it, it, you know, it's not the most comfortable thing to hear. And then all of a sudden, this person would just jump in there and start offering all, just throwing information at them, throwing stuff at them, left and right. And I'd be sitting there, and as the pastor, I'd be thinking to myself, shut up, shut up, shut up. It is not necessary to bombard this poor person who you don't know their life circumstance. You don't know their situation. You don't know what they grew up in or how they have been taught as a child. It's not necessary that everybody understand everything at this exact moment in time. Give them time. Give them space. Let God do His perfect work. Amen. Amen. The Word of God said that God is perfecting us. And God is doing His perfect work. Let God do His perfect work. But the problem is a lot of people demonstrate their lack of faith in God. Yeah, I said it. By trying to do His work for Him. Yes, they do. I'm going to tell you, a lot of times when you hear things, even things that are sinful, even things that are completely wrong, even things that are completely contradictory to everything you understand in the Word of God, there are times 
when your best response is silence. Why? Because God is able. Yes, is. God is able to help that person. God is able to bring them into a greater light and a greater understanding and greater revelation. You don't have to do it for them. You don't have to do it for Him. A lot of times I've, I've had people, I had a man visiting our church one time couple of years back and he began to talk to me about how he believed in polygamy. He believed that there was nothing wrong with polygamous relationships and all that. Now I'm going to tell you, again, I stated, there's nothing wrong with sharing your thoughts. There's nothing wrong with sharing your understanding. The issue here is not so much in what we share sometimes as how we share it. The Apostle Paul said, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. What should I do? Should I tell this man he's not welcome in our church because he believes that polygamy is uh, an acceptable form of marriage? Uh, should I tell him that he no longer should bother gracing our church and walking over the threshold of our building because after all, we don't believe in this. And no. But he began to talk to me about it and I, I just said to him, I said, well, I don't really agree with you on that. I said, I believe the Word of God teaches that the ideal that God set forth from the beginning of time was a commitment between two human beings because frankly, uh, working out a relationship with one other human being takes an enormous amount of effort and enormous amount of work. And I can't imagine how you could effectively and properly have a relationship with uh, more than one and be the least bit effective in it, I, you know, uh, I just can't imagine. I said, but you know, I, I can't say I agree with you, but now see, I didn't come at him like, well, let me show you the Word of God says, bah, 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 bah. the Bible teaches, bah, bah, bah. you follow what I'm saying? So there are many instances where wisdom will dictate to us not so much what we say as how we say it. Or wisdom will dictate to us whether or not it needs to be said at all. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Amen. But we live in a world, we live at a time when every person in the church seems to think that they've got a perfect grasp on how Christians are to believe and how Christians are to live. And they think it is their sworn duty before God to set everybody else straight. And the minute they hear anything that is the least bit different to the way they see things, they think it's their job to set that person straight and to make things right. When that may not altogether be the best response. Well, Pastor, what is the best response? Well, the best response always is pray for them. Yes. You know, it cracks me up. I grew up in a family that if someone became sick, I mean, it didn't matter how sick they were, whether they had the flu or whether they were given a terminal diagnosis, whatever the sickness, whatever the illness, whatever the disease, my family would call around and begin to solicit prayer. Because we believed in the power of God, we believed in the power of prayer, we believed that God answered prayer. When it came to sickness. But. If you mention something to someone. And you said. Well you know I was talking to Brother Jones today. And Brother Jones was telling me that. He likes to have a beer when he eats his pizza. I knew a, Pe a Pentecostal man. Many years ago. 
and he drank beer, listen, only, he was Italian, he was from Italy, he spoke with a thick Italian accent, and it was as, as much cultural as it was anything. And he drank beer only, listen, when he ate pizza. He didn't drink beer for recreation. He didn't drink beer as, you know, a, a favorite drink, you know. He didn't drink it to feel lighter and in more of a party mood. He didn't drink it to attract the ladies. He had a wife and kids. But when he ate pizza, he loved beer with pizza. Well, boy, I'm going to tell you, growing up in the church I grew up in, good Lord have mercy, you didn't even use mouthwash that had alcohol in it. I mean, oh, my Lord have mercy. Uh, I can just imagine this man mentioning that in the wrong company, and all of a sudden he's going to have somebody preaching at him. Well, the way I see it is... And they're going to begin to speak words, and those words are going to bring condemnation, criticism upon the hearer. We don't know the effect sometimes our words have. You know, there are people who have been part of our church again right here in Dallas, and I've been pastoring a long time, long before I came to Dallas, long before I came out and started affirming ministry. I've pastored hundreds of people. And I've seen people who are very opinionated and they don't think anything of just letting their mouth run off and every thought that swings through their puny little brain winds up crossing their lips. And they're very opinionated and they just spew out things without any thought in the universe as to how those things might be received by the hearer. And I've watched people spewing thoughts, for instance, about HIV and AIDS having no idea that sitting right next to them is somebody who's HIV positive or somebody who's living with AIDS. But they're just spewing off their thoughts. They're just spewing out their opinions on the subject. And I'm sitting there knowing something about the neighbor next to them that they don't know. And I'm looking at that person's face and I'm seeing their countenance fall. Because they're hearing something that sounds critical. They're hearing something that sounds condemnatory. Well, if you're stupid enough to act in a way that, you know, you wind up getting infected, well, bless God, you just need to deal with the repercussions of that, don't you? You know what I'm saying? You see, you think you know the life circumstance of everybody else in the room, and you don't. That's right. I've had people in my church who sold products or sold goods that I was very much interested in. And I wanted to be able to buy the product or the service that they sold until their mouth was running one day and I heard them talking about something that happened to be an issue that I'm dealing with that they're not aware of. And all of a sudden, Booby, I was like, well, I can't get that service off of them. I can't buy that product off of them. Why? Well, because when you do, you've got to share certain information with them or you've got to, you know, the process, like, for instance, insurance and what have you. You've got to go through uh, your... Uh, health history and what have you, if you, for instance, if you're going to buy life insurance. And hearing this person spew their thoughts and opinions on all kinds of subjects made me realize, good Lord have mercy, if I start listening to all that stuff I got wrong with me, this person's going to look 
down on me. They're not going to look at me very favorably. They're going to, you know, because they're they're so opinionated on the subject. Like, well, what's wrong with somebody? You've seen senators on uh, television and on the internet who make comments like, well, people with pre-existing conditions, you know, they brought that on themselves. Well, that's the most idiotic, stupid thing they could ever say. But if you get somebody who has these kind of opinions, you know, and you happen to have a pre-existing condition like diabetes or, uh, or uh, leukemia or whatever the case might be, then all of a sudden you decide, well, I don't want to do business with this guy. Now, I can go to somebody else and buy that very same product from them, and I don't feel it has nothing to do with sharing that information in general. It has to do with the attitude and the thoughts that they express and now you become uncomfortable sharing that information with them. So while I've had people in the church who sold goods and services that I was very much interested in, they lost out on that sale because their big mouth ran consistently. They constantly had diarrhea of the tongue. And I just felt uncomfortable at that point pursuing that good or that service or that merchandise from them. The Apostle Paul said, there's room in the church for people who have differing views and differing thoughts and differing understandings and differing ways of seeing things, Tommy. And he said, Receive those that are weak. You see, there are people, a lot of times, the view they have and the ideas they have and the way they see things are based on, frankly, a very weak understanding of Scripture. Maybe, you know, a very immature, maybe they're a new Christian. Maybe they're uh, an immature Christian. They're not a very well-developed. Maybe they haven't been under good teaching. And he said, don't reject these kind of people simply because they're weak in the faith. Because they don't see everything the way you see it. They don't understand everything the way you understand it. And he gives some examples and he goes into the law of Moses. And he said, for instance, there are some people who... Uh, will eat certain foods and other people who don't feel comfortable eating certain foods. He said, whatever the case is, it's fine. It doesn't matter whether you believe in eating these foods or not eating these foods. Seventh-day Adventists don't believe in eating meat. Said if you get somebody comes in the church and says, "Well, I believe that uh, God would have us to eat a vegetarian diet. I just don't believe in eating meat." Okay, fine. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to debate with you. It's not necessary. I don't have to explain to you. You do not have to understand things the way I see it. It's not necessary. That's the way you want to believe? Fine. You know what? Three months from now, they may very well be sitting down with you at Denny's after church chomping down a hamburger. Why in the world do we get so pressed and so pushed into thinking that it's imperative that we act now, that we speak now, that we bring others around to our way of seeing things and our way of understanding things? Why is it always such a hurried rush that we do this. Paul said, Tommy, for my good Jehovah's Witness friends, it's funny that Paul specifically mentions this. He said, some regard one day above another. Some celebrate Christmas. Some celebrate the 4th of July. Some celebrate birthdays. He said, others do not. Okay. There's room for both of them in the church. There's no issue there. It's not necessary that I persuade the individual who looks at things one way to again look at things the way.
way I understand it and to see it the way that I understand it. Now as a pastor, I'm going to teach on these subjects. I'm going to talk on these subjects. They're going to hear about these sorts of things over the course of time. But if they express to me, well, bless God, you know, I used to study with the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and I really do believe they're right when it comes to celebrating Christmas and blah, blah, blah. Okay. There is absolutely nothing in the world that has been said that requires me to go into a big debate or begin to argue with you or try to convince you that you're wrong and I'm right. There's nothing immediately necessary for me to do that. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Paul said, there's room in the church. Everybody in God's church does not have to think exactly alike. Everyone in God's church does not have to see things identically, does not have to look upon things identically. Boy, am I glad for that. I'll tell you why I'm glad for that. Because every human being brings into the study of any document or the study of any doctrine or any belief system, they bring into that study their own life experience, they bring into their study their own set of circumstances, they bring into that uh, pursuit uh, their own understanding of certain issues and certain things, and guess what? We don't all have the same life circumstance. We don't all have the same understanding. We don't all come at things from the same perspective. When we read in the Old Testament about God's uh, law concerning rape and how the Lord said it's necessary for a woman, uh, if she's to be found blameless, to cry out. Boy, now you got some people who say, okay, bless God, if that's what God says, then that's the way it should, then it should be. Well, they've never been raped. But you get a woman who has been raped, and she hears that, and boy, I mean, it hits her ear in a terrible way. It says, well, but what if I did, and I got killed over it? What if I did, and I wound up with this man killing me because he told me to shut up and not say anything, not make any noise, or he was going to stab me, or he was going to shoot me. Do you follow what I'm saying? We bring our own experience. We bring our own uh, background into. I don't care what anybody says. When you study the Word of God, Everybody on the planet brings certain prejudices with them. It, I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. Everybody brings certain prejudice, meaning they, they bring certain set mindsets into certain things. If you're somebody who's ever been the victim of incest, for instance... And you read the story of Lot and his daughters escaping the city of Sodom as the judgment of God is poured out upon it. And you read how that they take up shelter in a cave and all of a sudden Lot's daughters decide they're going to get daddy drunk and they're going to lay down with him so that they can become impregnated by him so that he can have male offspring so that the family name can continue. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you've ever been the victim of incest of any kind, you're likely to read that and become quite disgusted and become quite upset. And people think, oh my God, that's the most horrible thing, blah, blah, blah. And boy, I mean, they'll have a certain reaction. And then you get other people who read it and they just look at it as a matter of fact. You know, oh, okay, so that's how it happened. That's what happened. See, it doesn't hit them the same way because they have an entirely different set of life circumstances. So do you understand what I mean when I say that today? And this is why it's so important that we understand today the way I see it is not the way everybody has to see it in the church. There is more damage done to church growth and church development. And I'm going to be frank today. I'm going to say it as plain as I can say it. 
since I've been in affirming ministry, especially in Dallas, Texas, more damage has been done to our church. This work. We probably would have a hundred people in service today were it not for people who were part of the church who constantly felt the need to convince others to see things the way they see it. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. We've had people who every chance they get, they're bending the ear of someone else in the church and trying to convince them that they're to understand things and they're to interpret things and they're to see things the way they do. And next thing you know, we've got people dropping out of the church. We've got people who were coming steady for a good while. All of a sudden, booby, we never see them again. We have one particular individual who is part of our church for a number of years. And this individual brought a number of friends, a number of acquaintances to church. And many of them, if not most of them, began to attend regularly. And Tommy, what happened over the course of weeks or a few months? All of a sudden, they would drop out. Uh, this one individual, all of a sudden they'd drop out. All of a sudden, we'd never see them again. Yet, we've had other people who brought friends and who brought acquaintances and brought... And their friends and their acquaintances continue to come, continue to come. And even when that individual has moved on and gone, uh, moved to another state or gone somewhere, their friends continue to be a part of the church. What's the difference between them? Well, see, I know individual one, and I can tell you right now, individual one constantly, constantly tries to convince everyone around them that they must see things the way they see things. So if they took offense at something the preacher said, then everybody in the church has to take offense at what the preacher said. If they didn't like what the preacher said, then everybody around them has to not like what the... Do you follow what I'm saying today? And this is the kind of conduct that sadly is pervasive in fundamentalist and evangelical circles. I saw it my entire life. I saw many people who would start out in the church and then after a while they would drop out. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to confess something today. I've come to realize that in years past that I was pr probably more guilty of this than most people. And I know specific circumstances. I actually can remember specific circumstances where my big opinionated mouth and my desire to help people understand everything the way I understood it, because bless God, the way I understood it was perfect and right, and the way everybody needed to understand it. I remember specific incidences where that trait on my part hurt the church that I was a part of at that time. It wound up causing someone to stop coming to church. It wound up causing someone to leave the faith. I remember incidents, and I'm going to tell you, it hurts my soul to think that I ever played a role in serving as a stumbling block. Doesn't the Word of God tell us that we're not to lay a stumbling block in front of another? So I know what I'm talking about today. I'm not up here claiming perfection. I'm not up here today saying, oh, I've always done this right, and other people need to figure out how to do it right. No, that's not what I'm saying. I've been there. I've done it. Listen, Paul said in, in verse 10, Romans 14, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
We're all going to answer to God individually. So why in the world do you feel the need to sit in judgment of what your brother thinks or how your brother sees things or how your sister in the faith understands things right now. If you think they're wrong, if you think they're immature, if you think they're weak in the faith, then the best response would be to pray for them. You can pray for the sick and believe God will heal them. What in the world is wrong with you that you cannot pray for somebody who has a wrong understanding of something and believe that God will help them find the right understanding. Mm -hmm. I've talked about it before. I had a young man in my first affirming work in New York City and every service he would talk about after church, he would talk about going to a bar or going to a club to meet up with friends and stuff. And, and I mean, he'd be leaving church and he said, well, now I'm going to go, uh, I've got friends, I'm going to meet down at the Monster, or I've got friends, I'm going to meet down at the Duplex. And, you know, and every time he'd say that, Tommy, I'd cringe on the inside. I'd think, oh God, how in the world can somebody go from church and go directly to a bar? I don't understand it. I, I don't, but wisdom was whispering in my ear, hold your peace. Now I know people, I guarantee you, if Sister High Hair Holiness is watching this video right now, she's, her dentures are chomping. She probably grinded them down to the nub right now. Ah, you should have set him straight, hallelujah. You should have let him know. This young man had grown up Roman Catholic. He had never been in a Pentecostal church. He didn't know the Word of God. He was new to the faith. He was weak in the faith. And wisdom spoke in my ear and said, hold your peace. So I did. But I'm going to tell you, every time I prayed, I was praying for this kid. And I said, Lord, please help him, Lord, to understand. You're going from one environment where the things of God and holiness and righteousness and godliness are being exalted. And then you're walking from there into the exact opposite atmosphere where everything you can do wrong is being encouraged and everything you can do wrong is being welcomed, you know. Where you're likely to fall into doing things you might not ought to be doing. Not because you're going to split hell wide open, but because it's counterproductive to your life. It's not going to help you. It's going to hurt you. A lot of what God asks of us, it's not about heaven or hell. It's about you want to live your best life. You want to live your most productive life. You want to be uh, the best that you can be. Then stay sober. You want to be the best that you can be. Don't bother with alcohol. Don't bother with drugs. Don't bother with illicit sex. Don't sleep around. Don't use people. Don't allow people to use you. Because those things are detrimental to our mental health and our psychological well-being, not to mention our spiritual journey. So I'd pray for him and I'd pray for him. And then months passed and he continued to come every Sunday, every Sunday, every Sunday. All of a sudden, one Sunday, he got up to testify and he said, you know, he said, I, I inherited the care of my brother and my sister when I was 18 years old. My parents were killed in a terrible automobile accident. And I had a brother and a sister who were only teenagers, he said. And, and when my parents died, the courts allowed me to, to take custody of them. And he was only like 18, 19 years old. Can you imagine at 18, 19 years old taking on that responsibility? He said, my, my parents didn't have life insurance on the house and everything, so I had to pay the mortgage to keep the house. I had to pay the taxes. I had to pay the insurance. I, and he said, and I was working a job, and I've been doing all this for years. And he said, oh, he said I'm going to tell you, the stress of this would be so overwhelming at times that I was constantly finding myself going out looking to find somebody. I wanted somebody to share my life with, but it, I found it was easier to find somebody to share my bed than it was to find somebody to share my life. So then I got to the point where even though I, that's not really what I wanted, I'd settle for it because I hated being alone all the time. I hated bearing this burden by myself all the time. 
He said, and I found myself addicted really to sex and just constantly feeling compelled to go out and find somebody that would be willing to spend the night with me. He said, just the other day I was at home after work. He said, I used to go to the clubs, the bars, just about every night after work. He said, the other day I went home after work, he said, and I was sitting there and all of a sudden it dawned on me. He said, all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, do you know it's been a month since I've even walked into a bar? It's been a month since I've even walked into a club. He said, Pastor Charles, I literally didn't even realize that that much time had passed and I hadn't even gone into one of those places. He said, I didn't stop going because you told me to stop going or you preached that I was going to hell if I went because you, you haven't said that. He said, but you know, my walk with God has been so wonderful and it's been so good. He said that when I go home now, I don't feel alone like I used to. I don't feel the need to have somebody with me like I used to. I'm getting chills right now just remembering this gentleman sharing this story. But my point is this. God is able to do better than anything you could ever do. He's able to do it better than you can do it. He's able to do it in a way that is constructive and positive. I remember Brother Gillum telling me years ago, he said, Chuck, the best advice I can give you, son, about pastoring the church is just stepping back and letting God do it. Amen. That was the best advice he ever gave me. He said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, there ain't nothing you can do that God can't do better. Nothing. There ain't nothing you can do that God can't do better. And that is the truth. That is absolutely the truth. But you see, people who don't really trust God, people who don't really believe God, people who really don't have the faith they claim to have, tend to think that if I don't correct this person, if I don't show this person the right way, if I don't articulate this to this person, they're never going to find it. I've got family members who treat me like dirt because of who I am got family members who won't even stay in the same room with me because they're so holy and they're so righteous and I'm so filthy and I'm so terrible that they can't even draw me stay in the same room with me. Then I've got a little out great aunt up north, United Pentecostal holiness lady, and for decades, I can go to her home. I can go to her home with my partner. And she welcomes us warmly. She's loving. She's hospitable. She's kind. She never says one negative word. Never. I just had an opportunity to visit with her again. She's in her 90s now. I had the opportunity to visit with her last year when I made a run up north for my uncle's funeral. Not her husband, he long ago passed away, but another uncle. And my Aunt Betty, bless her heart, I'm going to tell you, she was just so sweet. And you want to know what's funny, Tommy? Our whole conversation was lifting up Jesus. Our whole conversation was about the Word of God. Our whole conversation was about the things of God. Our whole conversation was about the testimonies of the goodness and the power of God. Not one thing that was spoken in her presence was anything that was dishonoring to Christ or the gospel for which he died. I could have that same relationship with all kinds of family members. But oh no, they're too righteous, they're too good, they're too pure. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Mm -hmm. If you don't see things the way they see it, then they don't want to be bothered with you. Paul said, why do we do this? Why is this necessary? Why do we set it not thy brother? said, in the end, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. James chapter 4 verses 10 through 12 James, the brother of Jesus, wrote, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges, judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law... Thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. For there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? James said, if you're going to sit and judge other people because they're not keeping the mandates and edicts of the law as you see it and as you understand it, he said, uh, then you're no longer a doer of the law because the doer of the law concentrates on what? On what they're doing. He said, but if you're judging what others are doing and how others are doing it, if you're trying to get others to see things the way you see it, he said, well, then you're no longer a doer of the law. You're now a judge. You've made yourself a judge. And the Word of God tells us what about judges? What does it tell us about judging? Well, in Matthew 7 and 1, Jesus said, judge not that ye be not judged. In Luke 6, 37, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. In John, the 7th chapter, verse 24, Jesus said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. In Romans 14, verses 13 and 14, Paul wrote in his letter to the church at Rome, Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an, eight, or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know, Paul said, listen to this statement, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. I could do like preachers do. Everybody say uh, nothing. No, I'm not going to. I can't stand when they do that. There is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. If you understand something not to be right, then you had better not do it. Right. If I believe that sexual orientation hasn't got a thing in the universe to do with one's faith or one's uh, ability to tap into the grace of God and to participate in the uh, plan of salvation, and you don't believe that, well then you better not be LGBT. Mm -hmm. But don't you dare sit there and try to judge me in it because, honey, God had not called you to be a judge. He's called you to follow the law. So you're not supposed to be one who is pursuing judgment. You're supposed to be one who's pursuing proper conduct and proper action. So you live right. You do what you believe to be right. I'm going to do what I believe to be right. We're both going to do the best we can within the context of who we are as individual human beings because that's the best God can expect of anybody and that's all God asks of anybody. 
Romans chapter 14, verses 22 and 23, Paul said, Hast thou faith? Listen, have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This is where Paul told us in our initial text today that every man must be persuaded. Let every man, Paul said, be fully persuaded in his own mind. You have faith, you've got beliefs, you've got convictions, then live it unto yourself before God. You don't have to educate the world on your convictions. You don't have to convince everybody on the planet and everybody in the church to do things and to see things and to understand things the way you see and understand them. That is not your responsibility. No, your responsibility is to live up to your understanding. If God's revealed more to you, if God has helped you to understand better than I understand, if I'm weak in the faith and that's why I have an a, a understanding of things that isn't altogether accurate, according to Paul, there's still room in the church for all of us. Am I right. telling the truth yeah. today? Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh, I'm going to tell you, God's church would be benefited today if people would stop <coughs> prefacing so many of their thoughts with, well, the way I see it. Uh huh. Hello now. The way I see it, you can't be gay and Christian. Well, that's fine. That's not the way I see it. Amen. And I don't need you to stand there and spend five hours trying to convince me. You know, I want to close. I'm trying to bring this to a close. It, you know, I learned a long time ago that it is an empty, wasteful exercise to try to debate with someone who's in a cult. You, 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 it is just the dumbest thing you can do. And yet I know Christian people who every opportunity they get, they're going to stand there and they're going to try to debate with somebody in a cult. First of all, the Bible said, No man cometh unto the Father except the Spirit draw him. If somebody doesn't have a mind and a heart to know the truth, honey, you can lay it out in front of them as clear as a bell and they're still not going to see it because they have no heart, they have no mind to see it. They don't want to see it. They're not interested in the truth. They're interested in what they believe. They're interested in, in towing the line. But one of the reasons I've learned over the years that it's a waste to bother trying to debate or talk with somebody who's in a cult about their beliefs and stuff. You know, people think, well, this scripture will set them straight on this. This scripture will set them straight on that. Um, honey, I got news for you. They're in a cult on this planet that has a single doctrine or a single belief that they don't also have an alternate explanation for that scripture that you think is going to set them straight. That's true. There's an alternate explanation. There's another. They're going to see it differently than you do because they've been taught differently. They've been indoctrinated differently. In many instances, they've been brainwashed differently. And therefore, anything you have to offer is going to fall on deaf ears and it's going to fall before blind eyes. So why waste your breath? If you want to help that person, pray for that person. Because God is able to open their blind eyes. God is able to bring illumination to their deception. God is able to cause them to see the truth and to recognize the error of their way. Folks, today, I'm here to tell you it is not necessary to run around speaking to every believer and every person on this planet, helping them to understand the way you see things.